And now, for your pleasure and enjoyment, let's hear from Steve Behrman on Defying Gravity. What? No, no, that's for the recording. That's for the recording. Yeah, I've got, I'm double mic here. Okay, after the, the musical interlude, we have an outer lewd. I try not to be too lewd. <laughs> so this is called Defying Gravity. I call the program Beyond Ananda and Beyond, um, so that we can, if, if we wish, reflect a little bit about humor and about our world condition and how we can actually use humor in a constructive way. So there'll be some, a chance for you to share and some questions. But I just want to offer something that, uh, that I came across many, many years ago, and I've used this as kind of a theme for what I think humor can do. Um, it's something that happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest we've come until now, uh, blowing ourselves up. And um, at the time, according to John Kenneth Galbraith, who was an economist, he was part of a group meeting of uh, uh, American and Soviet economists who are meeting to discuss the possible trade between the two countries. And when news of the missile crisis hit, everything stopped. There was tremendous tension in the room. And finally, one of the Soviet delegates rather timidly raised his hand. He said, I suggest we each go around and tell a joke. And he volunteered to start. His joke was, what's the difference between capitalism and communism? In capitalism, man exploits man. In communism, it's the other way around. <laughs> and of course, the entire room exploded with laughter because all of that tension being released and dissolved in the recognition of who we really are beyond the isms. And so from that story, I've developed something that I call the alchemy of humor, which is where does a joke get its energy from? You know, where does that ejaculation get its energy from? And it's the four elements. It's earth, it's water, it's fire, and it's air. And the earth is the gravity of the situation, a heavy situation. In that particular case, uh, you know, it was, you know, a lot of these people were wondering if they'd ever see their families again. Then, of course, the water is the emotion, the emotional charge that, uh, that was in the, in the situation. The fire of surprise, that's what humor is about. We laugh when we're surprised and delighted. And finally, the air is the air of truth, the truth of who we really are beyond these systems. And when we make the choice to voluntarily allow laughter to be part of our lives, no matter what is going on out there, we get a certain degree of leverage, or the Swami would call it leverage, in, in a situation. And to give you an idea of how powerful this was, you maybe read uh, Viktor Frankl's book, Men's Search for Meaning. He talks about being in a Nazi death camp during World War II. And he and a fellow inmate made a pact. Each day they would find something to laugh about, no matter what. Because if they were able to laugh, they were able to preserve some degree of freedom for, them, for themselves, spiritual freedom, where they couldn't be imprisoned. And to give you an idea of how the kind of leverage that happened. One of the jokes that actually circulated inside the camps involved these two Jewish guys who decide they are going to assassinate Hitler. They know that Hitler's motorcade is going to pass this one intersection uh, at 11 in the morning. They're waiting for him. He doesn't show up. 11.15, 11.30. When he's not there by 11.45, one of the assassins says, gee, I hope nothing's happened to him. <laughs> That's powerful. That's very powerful. And, and so humor is a disruptive force. It's a disruptive force disrupting our normal, usual ways of thinking. Um, and you ever wonder why jokes happen in threes, a minister, a priest, and a rabbi? You ever wonder about that? Minister, a priest, and a rabbi, they're discussing legacy. How they want to be remembered. What they want the eulogists to be saying when they're laying in their casket. And the minister says, well, I want them to say, he was a family man and a pillar of his community. The priest said, I want him to say he was a holy man and a leader of his flock. The rabbi says, I want him to say, look, I think he's breathing. Uh -huh. 
number one, sets up the premise, number two, reinforces the premise, number three, upsets the premise. Here's one that's inappropriate um, <laughs> these days. Um, three, three guys are discussing their, their sex exploits with their wives the night before. There's an Italian, a Frenchman, and a Jewish guy. The Italian says, last night I covered my wife with, with olive oil. We made love. She was screaming for five minutes. The Frenchman says, huh, last night I covered my wife with butter. We made love. She was screaming for 10 minutes. The Jewish guy says, what are you talking about? Last night I covered my wife with chicken fat. We made love. She was screaming for an hour. You know, an hour? Well, yeah, I wiped my hands on the drapes. <laughs> the alchemy of humor. Slightly inappropriate topic, which means there's extra emotional charge, right, right, right? Then there's a surprise. You don't expect that. So th this is why it's such a disruptive force. And something, the thing that changed my life, a funny thing happened. Who's had a funny thing happen to them? Sometimes it's not that funny. So the first funny thing that happened, I was teaching at Wayne State University in Detroit, uh, uh, teaching auto workers labor history. And I got laid off because I was part time and they needed to put their tenured people somewhere. And the only job I could get because I had lived on a farm prior and knew how to do this, uh, I got a, a job as an equipment operator, chipping brush for the city of Ann Arbor, uh, Department of Parks and Forestry. And so I, summer was kind of fun, you know, you're outdoors, but winter in Michigan, you know, it was, it was kind of a dark night of the soul. I would get up every day, put on my jumpsuit and hard hat, go chip brush all day. I had a book published by Simon and Schuster. I had been teaching at Wayne State. Um, my Jewish mother, when, when she heard I was taking down trees with Dutch elm disease, she got very quiet. I said, what's the matter? She was afraid I would catch Dutch elm disease. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making that up. I said, mom, people don't get Dutch elm disease. Dogs get it. Said, dogs get it. She was worried about Buster. She said, what happens to dogs? I said, they lose their bark. So I'm at this job, and another funny thing happens. They put this new guy with me, Larry Kelsa. Turns out he's a brilliant psychologist disguised as a truck driver. And he and I hatched this plot. He says, you're a writer. We started an anonymous humorous newspaper, a lot like you would see The Onion or, um, or uh, Barowitz or one of those people. And we created an ongoing situation comedy at our workplace that we chronicled in this paper. Um, and each of the workers were, they were kind of stars in this, in this show. And we totally disrupted the workplace. We, people started doing things so that they would get in the paper. Hmm? Um, and we, we kind of created uh, mythical heroes out of these characters at the shop. And one of them was this young guy, Ron, who was very ambitious. So we said that he was campaigning for foreman, which is ridiculous. But the whole paper was ridiculous. And uh, so we wrote a speech for him. And I was shocked to find, I come to work one day, Ron is standing on the table in the lunchroom, reading and delivering the speech that we wrote for him. It was <laughs> getting a little bit too serious. And so the, uh, the hierarchy at the workshop was designated by the color of one's hard hat. We, we grunts, we, chippers of brush, we wore yellow hard hats. Tree trimmers wore red, crew leaders wore blue, and the foreman wore white, right? So one day, goaded by our paper, Ron goes to the supply cabinet, promotes himself by putting on a red hard hat. Everybody let him wear it for one day. At the end of the day, one of the other workers very ceremoniously removes the hard hat from Ron's head, runs over it with his truck. And everybody's wondering, how is the newspaper going to report this? And so our reportage was, Ron narrowly misses assassination attempt, gets his head out just in time. <laughs> and it was kind of brutal, brutal guy humor. But what that did was it, that's what got me started doing the Swami. 
that's got me started thinking, wow, I'm good at this. I see the disruptive power that humor has, way of getting ideas in under the radar. Hmm? And so um, when I started this publication, Pathways, which was one of the first holistic publications uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we knew we, the people took their spirituality very seriously. And so uh, we needed some kind of comic relief. And this name flew into my head, Swami Beyond Ananda. I went, that's funny. So we created the Swami as our mythical character. And he would make fun of these spiritual excesses. In those days, a lot of people were involved with prosperity consciousness. And of course, these people were all very poor, uh, paradoxically. And uh, you know, people chanting for BMWs and stuff like that. And so, so what Swami noticed is that half of the people wanted more money and the other half of the people wanted to lose weight. So Swami figured out a mantra to help you lose weight and bring more money into your life at the same time. Would you like to learn this mantra? Yes. Very simple. Everything I eat turns to money and my drawers are full of cash. <laughs> well, getting rich by the process of elimination. But what it was doing was allowing people to reflect on the shadow side of spirituality and what we're seeing right now in these apocalyptic times. And apocalypse means the lifting of the veils. The lifting of the veils. What that means is that the veils are being lifted on the toxic perpetrations that we've kept in secret. We're seeing this with uh, you know, the, all of the guys who are getting uh, exposed for exposing themselves, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I guess Charlie Rose one time too many, yeah. and, and all of these things that are, that are going on, it's all part of the shadow revealing itself. At the same time, the veils are also being lifted on these spiritual practices that have been kept in protective custody for centuries. So we're being given the tools of evolution to help us make, make it through. About 12 years ago, I got to meet Bruce Lipton. Who, who knows Bruce Lipton? I've seen him, okay. He's a brilliant cellular biologist. And we wrote a book called Spontaneous Evolution, which began with us laughing together, which we did a lot. And the idea behind that book is that uh, in Bruce's first book, Biology of Belief, he talks about our beliefs and perceptions being what determines largely our biology and our reality. It's kind of a filter that we experience things through. And so we looked at, well, what about our collective beliefs? What about our collective beliefs? And that's what spontaneous evolution is about. It's deconstructing some of the um, beliefs that we imagine science has proven for us, but actually science has proven the opposite. Uh, like, for example, survival of the fittest. It's not quite that way. It's thrival of the fittingest. Those organisms that fit inside of an <coughs> ecosystem are the ones that survive. Uh, it's not only matter matters. It's not the material world is the only real world. Einstein said the field is a sole governing pattern over the particles. So we are at a time when, as, uh, as somebody in this room once said, Every, everything you know is wrong. Right? Right, Phil? This is Phil Proctor. Do you know Phil Proctor? Fire Sign Theater. Theater. This is the man. Yeah. One of the four men. <laughs> one, of the four, one of the four horsemen of that, of that journey. That apocalypse. That apocalypse. You know, and that we've all, we've, we've laughed at this stuff. And this is a guy who was pumping ironies, you know, back in the day. So the whole idea, one of, the, one of the, my favorite albums is called Everything You Know Is Wrong. And indeed, just about everything we know is wrong. And we've been living like, like the, uh, you know, navigating on stars that have long since burned out, that have, uh, they're light years away and burned out. We've been navigating our civilization by principles that have burned out. Hmm? So part of the job of humor is to help us deconstruct and reconstruct. And humor's done a great job of deconstructing. You know, some of the great humorists that I've admired, the George Carlins of the world, for example, have done a great job of deconstructing um, the, the kind of beliefs and civilization that, that, that require deconstruction. But there's another job, and that job is to create 
that oneness, that focus, that heart, and that love, and have laughter be about that as well. So that's part of what I'm hoping to cultivate. I'm doing an online class called Defying Gravity. And we do this by cultivating levity, particularly in dark times, and that which is, which is what we're in. And what we're finding, I'm just going to ask you, uh, I know many people in here were probably, if not disappointed, then devastated at the election a year ago. How many people are feeling more encouraged now than they were like a week after the election? Anybody? Reality, what, what's happened is that we actually are awakened in a way that we wouldn't have been awakened. And so now the purpose of comedy is to continue to lift the veils on these contradictions that are, that are too toxic to handle without comedy. And then the second job is to light our way for a, for a different future. So everyone in this room knows how to do that. We all have had the experience of being with friends and laughing for no reason whatsoever. Even if we're not funny, we're not comedians, we find something, we notice something out there in the world that's funny. So what Trudy and I have been doing, we've been doing it in our own relationship, certainly, is we've been using humor to deconstruct the kinds of human issues that we have. Um, how many people are in a relationship? How many people have arguments in that relationship? Yeah, it's because of human stuff, right? And so what we've, what we've done, we've, we've cultivated this way of having arguments where um, one of us will remember that it's not really about that. And then the other one will, will say, but I wasn't done being right yet. Right? That's all it's about. Once you recognize that, once you recognize that really no argument is about what you think it's about. It's all about something that's been re-stimulated from the past. Once you recognize that the, that the, true, the truth of, of the situation is that we love each other, we're better than this, we're bigger than this, that's, that problem can be handled in a larger context. We put the love and humor in the foreground and we take the other and we put it in the background. Uh, and then we, I call it find the joke hidden in the picture. When you're upset, find the joke hidden in the picture. Um, so last year we celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. Not at all like the Henny Youngman. Um, my wife and I were blissfully happy for 25 years, then we met. Did not like that, no. <laughs> And, and, but, but, you know, when you're with somebody for a long time, they have endearing traits, right, that you love. And then there are the other traits that make you crazy and drive you absolutely nuts. And so one of the things, and Trudy will tell you, that, that she'll agree, Trudy is always the last one out of anything. And so I want to drive home. I like the sequence, drive home, fall asleep. I like that sequence better than the other. And Trudy is, she's still talking. And so I've made the mistake many times of walking out thinking she's following me. <laughs> so now I have to actually keep her in front of me at all times. And, I, and all of our friends know this and they laugh at it and it's very funny. But you can get plugged in. So last year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary and we're ready to go for a hike at our favorite place to go hiking. And I'm a dog, I'm a dog uh, in, in Chinese astrology, I'm a dog. Although in dyslexic Chinese astrology, I'm a god. I'm a dog. And so I have the leash in my mouth, you know? And I'm out there, I'm in the car. I made the mistake of leaving without having her in front of me. I'm in the car, and all of a sudden I'm going, she's not coming out yet. And uh, when they gave out patience, I got tired of waiting in line, so I didn't get any. And so I'm starting to get that slowly I turn, step by the, you know, the old routine, getting very plugged in. And I get, find the joke hidden in this picture. It took me a while, but then I got it. And I walked in and she's still the kitty cat, still getting ready. And I look at her and I say, Trudy, 
I've been waiting for you my whole life. <laughs> and you're worth waiting for. And Aww. yes. <laughs> and that changed the entire energy. We even forgot, we, we forgot that there was even like the little blemish of disagreement. So you can do that. You can do that for the people. You can commit random acts of comedy. <laughs> You know, we like to go into stores, you know, and um, we were at Whole Foods when they first started serving chicken pot pies. And I went to the woman and I said, excuse me, how much pot do you actually put in there? <laughs> and she whispers, not nearly enough. <laughs> so you can engage people, you can get people to play, you can get people to play. You know, and everybody, you know, humor is universal. Uh, a number of years ago, a friend of mine who's a publicist, she said, hey, come on with me. We're going to go see a troupe of disabled comedians. Oh, OK. And it was pretty very, it's very interesting. The first one comes on, there's four of them. First one comes on, and uh, this one, he had a speech impediment, but it actually worked. It was very funny. He was able to include it in his routine. It was very endearing. Uh, the second one obviously was hearing impaired because she did the whole thing in um, sign language, but it was obvious what she was doing. And the third guy comes out in a wheelchair. Um, very funny, very funny stuff. And that's pretty good. Fourth guy comes out, and I'm not seeing anything visible. So I got to my friend. I said, what, what's his disability? She said, oh, he's not funny. <laughs> So one of the secrets, <laughs> one of the secrets of committing random acts of comedy is to insinuate a joke into a serious conversation. So that making it sound like you're telling somebody very like a serious story. Because when it actually detonates, when you drop them off the cliff, there's more of a surprise, there's more of a delight, and then they laugh because they're they're surprised. Anyone can learn to do this. So on my website, wakeuplaughing.com, there's an ebook called The Zen Cohen's of Harry Cohen Baba, which are all 45 hilarious jokes that anybody can learn how to tell. They're all audience tested. And they all do that. They provide that surprise. They provide that delight. They provide that reframe. It's very powerful. So I'm curious, does anybody have any questions or anything about, uh, what, or comments about the first routine or, or anything here? Yes. Say that louder, please. Uh, kind of uh, two different kinds of comedy. One being sort of mean spirited, and, and the other being really heart filled. Things have gotten meaner because there is a there is a, a this furtive bubbling under the surface anger that people have had that they've been had that there's something not quite right. Uh, you know, and it used to be that you could be hip without being cynical. And now, you, you know, and now I think it may be switching back and forth. When I first started doing the Swami, people go, oh, it's corny. And I would say, yeah, but it's hard poor corn. <laughs> hard poor corn. Um, I think it's changing now. I find that young people are much more, uh, they don't groan at, at wordplay. They kind of like it. But I think that that's where the meanness comes from. Also, in the comedy world, and I'm not a comedian, I'm a comedy club comedian, but in the comedy world, a comedian will come backstage and they'll go, I killed or I died. And what is this life or death thing? It's whether you're able to get the audience to roll over and show their neck. Because laughter is a very defenseless thing. An audience is defenseless, like you're being tickled. And, and when, when a comedy routine is working, um, one joke builds on the other, and the audience is constantly being kept in this state of uh, titillation. That's a funny word, isn't it? And tickling and so on. And, and that's, what keeps it, that's what keeps it going. When I first started doing this 30 years ago, um, I got this gig at a club in Chicago, the limelight, which I called the slime light. I had to collect 
money from the mob. That was really fun. I had a great time doing that. But they didn't pay me the first night, so I had to go back and get my money. Um, and so I'm doing my Swami routine, and there are three guys, very drunk, and they get very obnoxious. I stop the show and I said, you know, I think you're abating me. And when you bait a great spiritual master, you know what that makes you? That's right, a masturbator. <laughs> Everybody laughed, you know, and the three guys slunk out of there. And I went, you know what? I can do it. I'm from Brooklyn. I can do that. But I don't want to do it. I want to create a space where the audience doesn't have to defend against the comedian. Um, my very good friend, Alicia Datner, who's also a stand-up uh, comedian, has a one-woman show, and she says that the comedy club is sacred space, meaning, meaning that thing, just as in the old days of the court jester could say anything to the king, anything can be said in the space of comedy club. People like Seinfeld and Chris Rock will not perform on campus anymore because of this toxic insanity called political correctness that is a toxic mimic of genuine respect. Um, I just did a program uh, for St. Petersburg College in Florida, and I, I wanted to teach a class. I wanted to be with students. And the one young woman who is the most vibrant and vital and present and alive, she said, I don't feel comfortable saying what I really feel. Very, very telling um, that we have that kind of fascism happening on campus. In the sacred space of humor, um, that is where you, you set aside all of these barriers and boundaries, and you have a place where things can be aired. Um, Brooke Medicine Eagle, who's a, a friend of ours who's a Native American teacher, told us a story about this um, festival in Santa Fe in the square, if you've been there. And there's a woman, elder, Native American elder, and she's very regal and very proper, and she's wearing beautiful turquoise, and she's wearing this fringed outfit and so on. She's standing there, and the heyoki, the clowns, the, the sacred clowns, are in the streets, and they're smashing watermelons. This watermelon juice dripping, and he smears all of this watermelon all over her beautiful outfit. And there's a quiet, and she bursts out laughing. Because in that tradition, comedy rules. The joker rules. That's the card that trumps all the other cards. And so when we, when we create a space where that's prohibited, we make it happen. Rush Limbaugh was created by political correctness. That's what made him. It brings out the nine-year-old boy in everyone. You can't tell me I can't say that. You know, so it's a long answer to a short question. But the two kinds of humor, there has to be a place where everything is appropriate in order for us to experience the whole of life, put it in its right place, and not have it come out in a toxic way that does damage. Does that make sense? Anybody else? Yeah. Louder. Many, many years ago, I heard humor defined as the sublimation of terror. The sublimation of terror. I think that's a very um, materialist psychologist way of looking at it. Um, who remembers Mel Brooks, the, uh, the, the 2,000 year old man? Carl Reiner, Mel Brooks. So, Carl, they're asking a 2,000 year old man, what was the first joke? He says, ah, the first joke. One day, a lion walks into the cave, uninvited, of course, and Murray, the jokester, the prankster, takes the lion by the tail, goes, yaha, over the shoulder. The lion gets up and eats Murray. Did we laugh? <laughs> so there's an aspect of humor that has to do with danger, that has to do with escaping danger, that has to do with relief of energy, release of of, of pressure. There's a really excellent book called Ha, <laughs> um, The Science of When We Laugh and Why by a brain scientist named Scott Weems, which I would recommend. He's not a funny guy, but he does really unload a lot of um, 
interesting ideas about that. Really, what humor is, it's a, it's a survival trait that's very closely related to creativity. The same dopamine rush we get when we hear a joke, and we hear the punchline of a joke, we get that when we solve a puzzle. And there's something about a joke that's solving a puzzle. You're taking two ideas that don't normally connect with one another, and you relate them in a uh, charming, novel, and surprising way. That's satisfying to the mind. So sense of humor has been considered a, an evolutionary trait because we want people around us who have that kind of flexibility. It's associated with being able to think creatively. You're thinking on many, many different levels at the same time. And when you learn how to cultivate that, you hear funny. You see funny, and you hear funny. And this, this happened to me. I was doing my program um, at Kaiser Permanente, physician wellness program. That's an oxymoron. They were very unwell, very stressed out. I'm looking at these doctors, paradox, and um, about 75% of them are from third world countries. So I'm doing the Swami, it's working okay, but the universe had a better idea. The universe did an intervention. I'm in the middle of my routine, all of a sudden I'm interrupted, and over the PA we hear, your attention please, your attention please, will the owner of a white explorer, license number BK3, 450, please move your vehicle, you're blocking traffic. Swami looks at these third world people, he says, you know, I've always thought that most of the problems in this world have been caused by white explorers. <laughs> I can't take credit for that. I can take cash. I can't take credit for that because it's that farce field, that's that space that all jokes come from. You know, it's like who came up with it first? It's in the field. It's in the field. Um, and so, you know, the, the universe threw me a, a, a cantaloupe, you know? It uh, could have been a blue Toyota. I might not have been able to make a joke about that. But I just heard that, and immediately that's what came to mind. Okay? So it can be cultivated like any other skill. Some people are born you know, better at it than others, but um, it, Trudy, she will tell you that she did not grow up in a home that had a lot of humor, but she learned, and she learned how to use humor in a really elegant way. Here's a healing humor story. Right after 9-11, we're at the airport in Denver going to a conference that should have been canceled. And everybody is really depressed. Everybody is devastated. Everybody's like in, in a state of shock. And troops are everywhere. It's just really tense. And there's a guy who's walking through there, and he has a dog in the doggy carrying case, puts the carrying case down, opens the dog, opens the case up so the dog can get some air. Doggy pokes his head out. Trudy walks up to the dog, and she says, did you pack your own things today? Did any stranger give you anything? Goes on. Everybody burst out laughing because the joke was peripheral to the tragedy, and yet it was something that could bring people in. Um, Lenny Bruce, uh, you know, great shamanic healer, Lenny Bruce. Um, he does. He has the misfortune of doing his first Carnegie Hall performance right after the JFK assassination. He has to say something. You have to acknowledge it. How, what is he going to say? Everybody's wondering. He gets out there, and his first thing he goes, wow, poor Vaughn Meter. Now, if those who, if those who remember, Vaughn Meter had the hit comedy album of 1963, First Family. He was the one that did the impersonations of John F. Kennedy. You know, for Vaughn Meter, a lesser tragedy, but a tragedy nonetheless because his life was ruined. He went, became an alcoholic and a drug addict and so on. He lost, imagine you've got the hit album. You wake up and you, you, you hear the news, you know, and you can't quite call him, well, uh, you know, can I uh, speak at the eulogy? Uh, no, that didn't work. And so that was a minor tragedy. But Lenny Bruce, yes? Did you know, Steve, I worked with Vaughn Meter. Did you know that he was going to have a comeback with Bobby Kennedy? 
Oh and my goodness. He got his act all together, and then Bobby was assassinated. Oh my God. That was when, that was the end for him. Wow. He became happy when he went back to his home. Wow. I didn't know that. You know, there was something, actually, right before that, there was a group called the Hardly Worth It Players in New York, and they did an imitation of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, they had him do a uh, wild thing, uh, you oh, made yeah. my, uh, my heart sing, you made, you know, and so on. They, so they had the Hardly Worth It Players. They did Senator Bobby, they called it. But wow, I didn't know that. Yes, devastating. Wow. wow. Talk about bad fortune. Yeah, I tell them. Wow. Yeah. Well, don't. <laughs> if it was me, I pray that I don't get to imitate anybody else anymore. <laughs> hey, they should have had him do Donald Trump imitations. Of him. <laughs> if only he were still around. Then. No, no, no. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Anyone else before I? Yeah. Yes. How did your wife actually learn to be funny? Did she make a comment? Come on up, Trudy. Let's, right, let's bring her up, ladies and gentlemen, right now on our show. What was the question? How did your wife learn how to be funny? <laughs> um, interestingly enough, with, uh, with my first Jewish boyfriend. There's something genetically, you know, that uh, it's like different nationalities have different things they do really well, and it's all not so well. And um, so my first Jewish boyfriend, he was great at telling jokes. And so, he taught me not only the word play, but the precision of the words that you use in a joke. You, you know, it's there's certain words you use in the timing and the phrases, and otherwise you're just, you're giving it away. You're giving away the magic trick at the end. And so he taught me to, what I did is I wrote down those key words and those key phrases on a little notepad and it didn't take me long where I, I memorized five, six jokes. And you know, it could come into a party and, 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 uh, and tell those. And that was part of it, seeing funny, hearing funny. You know, he started off, he handed me a rose. He came home from someplace and he handed me a rose. And he goes, I rose to the occasion. You know, I, I don't want to be a thorn on your side or just pedal myself to you. You know, and it just goes on and on and on with that. And I just, I just loved it and I heard it. Seeing funny and hearing funny. It's like just booting that up. And that's how, that's how it worked. And then, of course, I got with the master. <laughs> so good. One day, I have to say something. One day we wake up and it's a very tender moment. And, and we're lying there and, and he looked at me and he said, Honey, can I be frank with you? And I said, sure. And he goes, strangers in the night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta tell one okay, more. Okay, one more. <laughs> I used to have a lot of sinus problems and allergies and that kind of thing. And I would go through Kleenex like crazy, and it was really bad. So in order to kind of compensate, I would get puffs, heavy duty, and and then leave them around the house and use them more than once. Totally <laughs> gacked him out. Totally <laughs> gacked him out. It's not for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and he would always kind of like yell at me every time he found one. He would just be, yeah, uh, and um, okay. And one day, we go through the living room and he sees next to the end table, he picks up a Kleenex, and he looks, comes over to me, and he reaches me, he reaches behind me, and the Kleenex is in his other hand, and he goes, I want a tissue all over. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed, and it absolutely extinguished that habit. <laughs> it broke that Try this at home, folks. Thank you. Anybody else? One more question and then I'll say goodbye. Yes. It's it's part of the, the insulting and mean comedy. 
It's part of the stupidization program that's been going on in this country for many, many years. It's part of keeping people on edge, separate, angry. When people are happy, you can't sell them anything. They're complete, you know? But if you make people irritated, you make them dissatisfied, you make them think that everybody's your enemy, you create a lot of this, this danger, you create a lot of anger, um, and I think, I can't, I can't, I don't watch that stuff. I don't ever go to comedy clubs. And when I find a comedian that I love, and there are, there are a number of them out there who are out there today, Dimitri Martin being one of them, um, I go, wow, here's somebody who's really, really funny and doesn't have that unkindness. You know, and I think that comedians are, are kind of a neurotic set. Um, and I was, you know, I was a, a, when I was a kid, I grew up in a housing project. Um, I d used humor as a weapon and a shield. The older kids would ask me for money, and I'd go, hey, I live here. If I had money, would I be living here? Uh. Yeah, sure, they'd leave me alone. So I knew how to do that, and it took me years and years and years to take that armor off. A lot of comedians don't take that armor off. It's like, you know, if you have a, a kind of genius, sometimes your gene, you know, people will focus on your genius and then you don't develop these other parts of your personality. So there are a lot, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of meanness. You know, a friend of mine volunteers at this one a comedy club up where I live and she's shocked at how mean these people are. Um, and I think it, that's why I'm not a comedy club comic. I don't, I'm not totally not interested in that. I'd rather be with an audience that's up to something, that is willing to take it a step further. So that's why I don't bother with much of that stuff. Okay. Well, okay, one more, one more. Yeah. Uh, you know there's new uh, acting coaches and acting teachers that tell their students that comedy is always at the expense of others? I don't, I don't see that, but that's what they teach. Well, situation comedy is really situation tragedy. Um, and you're laughing because it's exaggerated, it's a laugh track, and it's happening to somebody else. So if you, if you, any of these, if you look at your favorite, whether it's, whether it's Lucy or Seinfeld or any of the other, any of the other, I think Seinfeld was the most ingenious of all because they would have three things going at the same time. But everyone is thwarted. Everyone is thwarted. So what it is, it's a way of teaching Buddhism. Situation comedy is a way of teaching Buddhism. It's a way of teaching non-attachment. It's a way of teaching how attachment leads to suffering. So if you look at Seinfeld, for example, the character who suffers the most, George Costanza, is the most attached. The one who suffers the least, Kramer, is the one who's least attached. I mean, it, it just, you know, it's really indicative. So what it is, it's a mirror of our human patterns that's put in front of us we get to laugh at that as we see the reflection and perhaps we get perspective on our own lives. So I, I think again, there's a lot of cynicism in all of these um, pat answers. It's deeper than that. Um, but we do live in, in a uh, it's me or you society and part of why we have the man in charge that we have now is for us to face that, deal with it and choose, some, choose again. Yeah. Have you ever played to an audience that had Trump supporters in it? <laughs> that had got what? Trump had Trump supporters in it. Oh, oh, of and course. What was it like? Oh, oh, well, I mean, I've I've played to all kinds of audiences. Um, this is going back to uh, right after the Iraq War invasion. I was doing the Carlsbad Theater, in, which is a military community in the north of San Diego, and my friend, who was a comedian, was there the week before. He says. I don't think these people are going to relate to your political material. So I, before the show, I'm doing this meditation, and what do I get? I get, do your material, love the audience, and smile. <laughs> so I get out there, I start off with you know, some generic stuff, and then I go, I've been asked not to do any controversial material, political material. So you've been a wonderful audience, good night. <laughs> And they burst out laughing, and the whole place came down, and then I did all my stuff. I did all my stuff. And at halftime, this woman comes up to me, 
She says, I'm from a military family. My husband works at the Pentagon. She says, I have never heard so much truth in one room as I heard just before. And she became, uh, you know, so again, when, you, when you're able to, uh, and I didn't do anything hurtful to anybody. It was not insulting. I just spoke my truth. I just spoke my truth. And what was really interesting, how many people in the audience applauded? So you go, know, oh, more of us agree than we thought. Ah. You know, just like I, I did um, the Transpartisan uh, Citizen Summit 2009. Um, Cynthia McKinney, we had Cynthia McKinney to Grover Norquist. Yeah, it was a very, very interesting little, little gaggle of people there. And I did comedy. And everybody loved it. And the people who I ended up getting the closest to, believe it or not, were the gun people from Idaho, the militia people from Idaho. That's who I became closest to. And I think it had to do with authenticity. I think it had to do with speaking your truth and being there with your truth and putting it out there wholeheartedly looking somebody in the eye. Not hurting them, not insulting anyone. You weren't so, afraid to shoot off your mouth. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I was shooting off my mouth. <laughs> it was a rapid fire. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but but it was there was something about it that was disarming, that was dis <laughs> that was disarming. You know, and, and that's that's what happens sometimes when you when you actually are willing to do that. What's really disarming is something about yourself. Abraham Lincoln was a genius at this. He's in a debate. His opponent calls him two-faced. He said, "Hey." If I had two faces, would I be using this one? <laughs> so self-facing humor. When you, when you make it about yourself, not as an insult, but as a high self-esteem activity, it's very, very powerful. OK, well, you've been a wonderful audience. Good night. <laughs> I'll meet you in there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to tell you that I discovered a, an incredible, important thing to me. With the increasing traffic in Los Angeles, the one way I guarantee to not only tolerate but enjoy it is to have his CD uh, right there uh, put in there. <laughs> and I can laugh through however many people are giving me the finger or whatever. So I got to tell you something about that. Uh, we were doing a show in the Midwest a number of years ago, and. This guy comes up to me, he says, um, I had Swami Beyond Ananda CD in the car. I get stopped by you know, the cops in Chicago who are speeding. And um, I guess he was nervous, so he's still kind of playing. And the cop said, Swami Beyond Ananda, huh? <laughs> well, don't let it happen again. And he let the guy go. <laughs>